thank you, uh, Charity, for uh, leading us in those uh, hymns this morning. If you have your Bible there uh, with you, I would invite you to turn to 1 Samuel 30 again. Uh, 1 Samuel and chapter 30, and we'll begin our reading at verse number 15. First Samuel chapter 30 and verse number 15. We're breaking into the chapter here where uh, David and his men are going to try to find who was responsible for what happened at Ziklag. And they have found a young man in the field and uh, David has asked him who he was and who he was with and uh, now this young man is going to take David uh, to those responsible for what was done at Ziklag and in verse 15 David said unto this young man canst thou bring me to this company and he said swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. And David took all the flocks and the herds which they drave before them those other cattle and said, This is David's spoil. And David came to the two hundred men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Bezor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, the men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff, they shall part alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. We'll end our reading there at verse 25. Let's just take a moment again to seek the Lord's help. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Thank you so much that your spirit has been given to your people. Your spirit has been given to the church that we might have eyes that are illuminated to see what is in this passage this morning. And Father, we acknowledge that the study of your word uh, without the help of the Holy Spirit is a futile exercise. We could do ourselves harm even in studying without the aid of the Spirit. And the reality is that this passage has um, in it because you inspired it. Father, we know we can't see them without the Spirit's help and we want to see them. We want to know them. We want to experience what you have in this passage for us this morning. And so we commit ourselves to you and ask for this grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Now, last week, in the opening part of this chapter, we saw what had taken place at Ziklag. The Amalekites had attacked Ziklag uh, while David and his fighting men were gone. And the Amalekites had taken uh, all of David and his men's wives and their sons and their daughters. They had taken all of their belongings and they had gone off with them. And they had left Ziklag going up in flames. So when David and his men came back and they were greeted by this sight, they were understandably devastated. They were absolutely overwhelmed. They were physically and emotionally exhausted. They were absolutely empty. And their problem was compounded by the fact that, that here they were with absolutely nothing in the tank, so to speak, but they still had a Mount Everest to climb. They still had to respond to this attack. And so it was an awful moment for them. And the passage is very clear that the defining moment at the bottom of that mountain was when David encouraged himself in the Lord. That is the defining moment when, when he is absolutely physically and emotionally exhausted, things change when David comes to the throne of grace. And that really is the moment that explains everything that happens afterwards. So watch closely uh, what exactly took place. In verse 8, David inquired of the Lord, if he should pursue whoever was responsible via the priest Abiathar who had the ephod with the Urim and the Thummim, David sought from God, should I pursue? What do you want me to do in this moment? And God said, pursue. So verse 9 we read, so David went and the 600 men that were with him. Now uh, notice uh, carefully how things begin to happen here. In verse 11, as they're leaving in this pursuit, they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread and he did eat. They happened to find a young man in the field who hasn't eaten for three days or for three nights. He is exhausted, they give him some food and whenever he is revived, David asked, verse 13, to whom do you belong and where are you from? David might suspect that this young man was implicated in what had happened in Ziklag. And he would be right. For verse 13, the, the young man responds, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb and we burned Ziklag with fire. So David's heart must have skipped a beat at this moment. He has found a remarkable source of intelligence and information. David now knows for sure who was responsible for Ziklag. He has a guide there to take him directly to those who were responsible. And by the time we get to verse 16, David is looking at those who were responsible. Verse 16, and when he, this young man, had brought David down, behold, they, the Amalekites, were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken. David has been led to this exact spot where the Amalekites are, to the exact spot where, where David and his fighting men's wives and sons and daughters and all of their belongings are. He has been brought right there. And as David's eyes fall upon this scene before him, what does he see? He sees that while he is outnumbered massively, by the Amalekites. The Amalekites are incredibly vulnerable. They are gorging on all of the food. They are celebrating wildly. They have no expectation of, of an attack upon them and no readiness for it. 
And therefore, when David attacks, look at what happens in verse 18. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. Now, the text is so clear here on something that we can't afford to miss it, and I don't want to belabor the point or kind of repeat last week's sermon, but, but, but just uh, bear with this for a moment. At the beginning of this chapter, David was so exhausted at the bottom of the mountain that he couldn't even shed another tear. He was exhausted. He was overwhelmed. He was crushed. He was empty. He was weak. And he had lost everything. Now we read that David is on the top of the mountain that he has recovered all. That's what the passage said. There was nothing that David didn't recover. It says David recovered all. And this is really begging for an explanation. How do we get from David, who is absolutely exhausted that he can't even shed another tear at the beginning of the mountain, to now he's at the top of the mountain fighting and fighting and fighting and recovering everything. Now, if we went back to the bottom of the mountain, we noted that there were unique temptations when we are in these moments of exhaustion and still got a mountain to climb. And the temptation that David's men fell into was to be very negative. They wanted to pin the blame on somebody for all of this. And it's not that David wasn't blameless, but his men weren't motivated by love or, or grace or mercy or compassion. They were motivated by selfishness and they were motivated by their pain and they wanted to stone David. And if this negativity had prevailed at the bottom of the mountain, they would all still be there. David would be under a pile of stones and everything would still be lost. David, on the other hand, rather than this negative response, did the most positive, constructive, and helpful thing he could do. He came to the throne of grace. And there he found mercy. There he found grace. And there he found help in his time of need. Now that according to the text, is the exact reason and explanation as to how David got from the bottom to the top and recovered everything. It was because he came to the throne of grace and he received mercy and grace and enablement and strength from God's hand to do what he then did. And so, child of God, this is a reminder to all of us and a challenge to all of us. In those moments when we are overwhelmed, when we are crushed, whenever we are hurting, we can be vulnerable to be negative and to, to kind of channel whatever we're feeling out of ourselves and onto someone else. But it actually gets us nowhere. It compounds the problem, but David came to the throne. He did the most helpful, constructive, beautiful thing that he could do and he received mercy and grace and help that enables him to scale the mountain. So now that we are at the top of the mountain, so to speak, in this passage, we once again notice that David and his men are sharing in a common experience. They have this euphoria over David recovering everything for them. But again, David and his men's reactions are very different. And the differences in their words and in their attitudes and in their behaviors stem from profound differences in their hearts. Now, uh, notice here the difference in their reactions. After David and his men had left Ziklag to pursue the Amalekites, something happened in verse 10. 
It says, but David pursued he and 400 men for 200 abode behind who were so faint that they could not go over the brook Bezor. So David and his 600 men set off from Ziklag. They get to this brook Bezor where 200 of them can't take another step. It says they were so faint they couldn't go on. Now, notice this, they were so faint, so weak, so powerless, they couldn't take another step. This, from what we understand, was really quite close to Ziklag. They hadn't gone any distance at all, and they are so beat that they can't help anymore. So the 400 go on, and they, David wins the battle, and it's in verse 21 that these 400 and David, laden with all of the spoil they've recovered, return. And listen carefully to what some of the 400 men that went with David have to say in verse 22. They answered all the wicked men and men of Belial, of those that went with David and said, because they, the 200, went not with us, we will not give them aught or anything of the spoil that we have recovered. Now, listen carefully to their words. We will not give them anything of the spoil that we have recovered. So they look down on these 200 men. There is a hardness in their hearts towards them. There is a harshness here. There is a coldness, a negativity and a stinginess to these 200 men. Now what the 400 say is technically true. These 200 went not with us. They didn't go. They, they didn't help in the battle. They didn't help to recover all of this spoil. That might be the truth. But underlying this hardness and this coldness and this, this negativity, there is a profound issue in these men's hearts. That's where it stems from, as we will see. Notice the difference in David's reaction, verse 23. David said to these men, Ye shall not do so, my brethren. And the passage takes us all the way down into David's thinking. Why is David's response different to the other men? It takes us into his heart. It takes us into his attitudes. David is not merely being diplomatic in his answer here. He is actually being deeply theological. Look at his response. Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord has given us, who has preserved us and delivered the company that came against us into our hands. David sees these 200 men who were absolutely so broken that they couldn't go on. And David remembers how broken he was at the bottom of the mountain. David can remember the taste of his own tears at the bottom of the mountain. Remembers how broken he was. David no doubt remembers his own guilt. He, he sees here these men who are so, were so exhausted they couldn't take another step and David can remember what it felt like in his own heart to feel sick with exhaustion. The, he can remember the, the rawness of his own desperate need at the bottom of this mountain. As he sees these men here and he sees that salt is being rubbed into their wounds as now these other men are saying, we're, we're not giving them anything that we have recovered. David can remember the, the feeling of the salt in his own wounds as these same men were so critical and negative and legal spirited that they wanted to kill him. David remembers his own plight and his own exhaustion and his own brokenness at the bottom of the mountain. And he also remembers the taste of God's mercy. He remembers as he encouraged himself in the Lord, the absolute euphoria when God was merciful to him. He can remember the taste of God's grace. 
God didn't owe David anything at the bottom of the mountain. God could have said, you've made your bed, David. You sleep in it. You left Israel. You, you work yourself out. But no, God offered him grace. And David can remember how delightful and relieved and amazed he was to receive grace that he didn't deserve. David remembers the taste of help in his time of need. And now, as David sees these 200 men, in David's heart, he seems to be thinking, I would be one of these men if it were not for the grace of God to me. As David climbed the mountain, so to speak, he was aware that every step of that climb, that I was too exhausted to cry a matter of hours ago, and now I have energy to climb, this is a gift from God. Every beat of my heart is a gift from God. The finding of the Egyptian in the field, that was a gift from God. The fact that that Egyptian got sick three days ago, that was the providence of God. The fact the Amalekites didn't pick him up and carry them on, that was the providence of God. The fact that he led us directly to the Amalekites, a gift. The fact that we find them so ill-equipped, so vulnerable, a gift. The fact that we returned with everything that we had lost, a gift. And David's heart here is so awash with gratitude that the giver behind all of these gifts to him was God. And the giving of all of these gifts was grace. It was unmerited by David. That when he is confronted here with this stinginess and this coldness and this negativity that this was our work and that we deserve credit for it and we should keep the spoils, David says an emphatic no. Look at verse 23. He's saying that everything that we have recovered is that which the Lord has given us. That all our wives and children are safe the Lord has preserved us. That we defeated the Amalekites, the Lord delivered them into our hands. David is so aware of his need of grace and his heart is so awash with gratitude for that grace that when David finds this negativity, he says no. God has been so kind to us who didn't deserve it that, 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 that we are going to be kind and generous to others who don't deserve it either. And I think we can say that this passage gives us a little clue that it has a significance that is far above and beyond this event alone. Uh, David isn't quite inaugurated as the king yet, but Look carefully at how fascinating verse 25 is. It was so from that day forward that David made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. David makes this a law from that day that if this scenario ever replays itself, those who were too weak and exhausted to go on are to be generously and graciously given the reward of the spoils from those that did go on. David is making a really powerful statement that the kingdom over which he reigns is a kingdom of grace. This is the first law, the, the opening statute that David enacts here is my kingdom is going to be a kingdom of mercy, a kingdom of grace, and a kingdom of love. Now, can I ask you, child of God, maybe you aren't at this moment in one of those places of utter exhaustion and being overwhelmed, and uh, maybe you are in a moment of joy, and maybe you are in a season of freedom and a season of rest, and, and life is very, very blessed at the moment. Can I ask you, though, how do you explain that? How did that come about? There can be a temptation to locate the answer to that question in ourselves, as if we were the 
architects of deserving all of these blessings. But if the answer that we give is anything other than God's kindness and God's grace and God's mercy, then it's the wrong answer. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, What hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou then glory as if thou hadst not received? James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Every blessing that we have as the people of God is a gift that comes down from God because of his grace, because of his kindness, and because of his love. And if everything, every beating of our heart, Every gift that we received is received on the basis of grace. Then how should we treat others? As David shows us here, with grace and with generosity and with warmth and with help. This cold, negative, selfish, stingy, legal spiritedness in this text is directly linked to the fact that they forgot or they failed to remember that this kindness came from the hand of God. It wasn't because they were better, it was because God had been gracious. When we hear of David's kingdom as a kingdom of grace, I think every redeemed heart says, that is beautiful. For this is a pointer to us of a greater kingdom that was to come. In the Gospels, when the king that out kings all of the other kings arrives, what do we see? He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. He says, blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are the meek. He tells parables about how his kingdom is one of grace and when this king is in the garden of Gethsemane he is about to climb a mountain that he didn't need to climb for himself. It wasn't a metaphorical mountain, it was real and he was alone and at the bottom of it we might say he cried and he sweat drops of blood. There was no one at the bottom of this mountain on earth to offer him help or to offer him encouragement. The disciples were so exhausted that they slept. The Pharisees were speaking of killing him, but he stumbled up the mountain too weak to carry the cross. And at the top of the mountain, he doesn't find an enemy that is vulnerable. He faces our enemies of sin and death, and he dies. He gives his blood, he gives his last breath, and he dies in that battle. But in so doing, I beg you to answer, what does this king achieve? He recovers everything that sin has stolen from us. Everything. There is nothing that we have lost as a result of our sin that he does not recover for us in that battle. He recovers it all through his death. And then he comes down the mountain and he offers us freely everything that he has recovered. He offers us freedom from the penalty of sin. He offers us deliverance from the power of sin. He offers us power to love and strength to obey. He offers us escape from God's wrath in hell, adoption into God's family, that we might be with God for eternity. As Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians, Christ is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And when he comes down that mountain laden with all of these 
spoils that he has single-handedly recovered, who are the ones that are there crushed with their guilt at the bottom, so exhausted they could never have climbed it, so broken they could never, that is us. And he freely, freely offers us everything that we had lost as a result of our sin, and he offers it as a gift. No stinginess, no selfishness. He single-handedly fought the battle and died on that mountain and he retrieved everything and he offers it to us freely. His kingdom is a kingdom of mercy. It's a kingdom of grace. It's a kingdom of love. There's no other way into it other than by his mercy, grace, and love. Can I ask, is anyone listening this morning who is under a burden of guilt, so crushed by your guilt that you know that you're just so, so crushed that you can't get yourself out of it? Is there anybody who, who is so, so heavy, and, and weary in all of your efforts to scale that mountain and to retrieve what, what, sin, uh, what sin has cost you. Is there anyone who realizes, I have got nothing to offer. I can taste my tears of, of, of my, my, own, my own spiritual poverty. Can I tell you, by the grace of God, in your exhaustion and in your guilt and in your brokenness and in your sin, there is a king who went and single-handedly through his death on the cross and his resurrection recovered everything that sin has stolen from you and he offers it to you on the basis of grace and mercy. If you repent of your sin, turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus, he will give to you everything that sin has stolen. For those who are saved this morning, I think this passage calls us to examine our hearts. How are our attitudes and our words and our behaviours towards others? Are we so aware that we're the ones left at the brook Bezor who had no strength, no power to save ourselves and he went and fought for us and freely gifted it all to us. If he did that for us, should we not be the most gracious, generous, loving, helpful people on the face of the planet? May God help us to never forget that we were broken, exhausted, guilty, and hell-deserving, and we contributed nothing to the recovery of the spoils, but we get to be deluged by his kindness. And therefore, when we see others exhausted and broken, tasting their own tears of weariness and guilt, and brokenness, that we would offer them what has been so generously offered to us. Charity led us this morning in Amazing Grace, a sweet the sign written by John Newton. John Newton's past is, is very well known and I'm not going to rehash it other than to say that he, he had a long list of, of awful sins to his name, involved in the slave trade, involved in all kinds of immorality, involved in all kinds of wickedness and, and spiritual darkness and witchcraft. He sinned with a high hand and he encouraged others to do the same. But one day, under conviction, he found that a king would take all of his sin and gift him salvation. And he wrote this hymn that is amazing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And John Newton was a changed man as a result of that grace. He wrote many letters to many people and in one of them he said this, 
Words to this effect. Whoever is truly humble will not be easily angry nor harsh or critical of others. He will be compassionate and tender to their infirmities, knowing that if there is a difference, it is grace alone which has made it. And under all trials and afflictions, he will look to the hand of his Lord and lay his mouth in the dust, acknowledging that he suffers much less than his iniquities have deserved. Here is a man so aware of his own poverty and God's grace that he becomes a giver of grace and mercy and compassion to others. May God help us to do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we think of your, the marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Marvellous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. We thank you, Father, that you have been so gracious to us. We would confess, Father, any hardness and coldness and stinginess in our hearts. We would grieve it and we would mourn it. And we pray that you would magnify to our hearts this morning how gracious you have been, that we might be people who show this grace to others. For anyone listening, watching, who's still under the burden of guilt and maybe trying very hard to climb the mountain to undo what has been done or recover what has been lost, we pray that you would remind them this morning that they can't, but you have. And you offer them salvation, abundant and free. Bless this to our hearts, we pray in Christ's name.